Sorry in advance, y'all, but it's going to be a rapey week. I can't help it. I started the week off with an inbox full of links to this story out of Ohio about a youth pastor raping a 16-year-old girl and then being asked to apologize to the youth pastor's wife. Now, first things first, the church has denied these allegations, so take this all with a grain of salt, but according to the victim's mother, she was told her family couldn't return to the church until her daughter apologized to her rapist's wife for having an inappropriate relationship with her husband. And it's worth noting that this was part of her testimony at the rape trial, not a lawsuit against the church. So kind of hard to see what she had to gain from making this shit up. Still, the church swears it was just a misunderstanding. They insist that, quote, the church arranged outside counseling for the victim and her family at the church's own expense, and that they, quote, reached out in support and love for both the victim's family and the family of the perpetrator, end quote. But here's the thing. Why would you tell a rape victim how much you support her rapist's family? Seems like the kind of thing that can just go unsaid if you're not trying to hush anybody up. I mean, if I'm in the mafia and I'm actually genuinely struck by what a shame it would be if something should happen to the local deli I'm in, I maybe keep that to myself. But if that's still too flimsy for you, don't worry. I've got an undisputed victim-blaming rape story for you, too. This one comes to us from Canada, where federal judge Robin Camp may lose his job after asking a rape victim why she couldn't just keep her knees together. According to the unnamed victim, he went on to explain that, quote, sex and pain sometimes go together. That's not necessarily a bad thing, end quote. And honestly, this dude's excuses are about one degree shy of the dog eating his sense of basic human decency. He started off by claiming that he was just being, quote, facetious, end quote. And when it became clear that nobody was buying his I was only fucking with her excuse, he moved on to claiming that he was just a simple caveman justice. Seriously, his backup justification was that he practiced law in South Africa for decades where the rape laws were way different. Now, something tells me you're not allowed to ask rape victims why they didn't shut that whole thing down, even in South Africa. But one way or the other, he's trying to claim that he should keep his job by arguing that he's unqualified for it. And regardless of legal minutia here, shouldn't one of the prerequisites to being a judge be having minimal empathy for humans? I guess the only silver lining here is that he's in Canada, so he can't make Donald Trump's Supreme Court shortlist. And lastly tonight, since you took those first two rape stories like a champ, I'll close on some good news. You may have heard of Ian McCann when he was arrested last week on charges of rape and attempted rape. He made atheist news circles by claiming that the Bible gave him the right to fuck whoever he wants, whenever he wants. Now, this is Arizona, not Indiana, so he wasn't let out because of RIFRA, but he was let out. Because of a clerical error, the police had to release him and couldn't issue a proper arrest warrant until the next day. And during that time, of course, McCann disappeared. Well, his luck ran out on Tuesday when a news reporter was doing an on-site record about the McCann story when the fucktard walks by in the background. Anyway, the reporter and her camera operator followed him and called the police, and he was arrested moments later. So I guess I have a little something to think about for those three months with good behavior. Uh, sorry, good news, good news, I promise good news. So, rather than releasing the tirade of fury over this country's grossly lenient rape sentencing guidelines, I'll force a smile and hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli.